Hello genealogist, this is Craig and this is Just Genealogy. I'm having a rough day today. This is the third time I've done this video. It seems the first time I didn't have my act together, which is very common before my first three cups of coffee. And the second time I just forgot to record it. So great days. But I wanted to be persistent and tenacious and talk to you about a set of books. And the first set of books is, or actually, it is a single set of books. It just comes from multiple places. It is Cavaliers and Pioneers. Abstracts of Virginia Land Patents. So the first three volumes come from the Library of Virginia. And then volumes four through eight come from the Virginia Genealogical Society. And then... Because somehow in 1690, 1692, I don't really understand why or how at this point in time, there were some records from the Northern Neck that ended up in the Virginia Land Office. Now the records of the Northern Neck Proprietary are not in the Virginia Land Office because Lord Fairfax had his own deal, the Fairfax Proprietary, so he had his own land office. So these, is, these be everybody else. And I believe that you can't do colonial Virginia genealogical research properly or easily or whatever without using Cavaliers and Pioneers. Now, I've already talked to you in the past about adventures of person person being uh, important to colonial research. So the combination of the two together are absolutely excellent. Now, first of all, we have to define what a patent is. And there's some confusion out there about what a patent is, and especially happens when somebody goes to look for a deed. They found the sale of the land, but they can't find how that person acquired the land. And many times, the reason you can't find it is because it's not a deed, it's a patent. And patents are found in government records. And in this case, these are Virginia government records uh, from the Virginia Land Office. A patent is the transfer of land from a government to an individual. Now that deed where it's being sold is known as a first deed and that deed transfers the land from a person to another person, individual to individual. So when you're dealing with government to individual, it's called a patent. Sometimes it's called a grant. So the way that I use these books uh, is to identify when people might have come into the colony, to identify what kind of neighborhood they may have lived in, uh, specifically even what county they lived in, first of all. But then I'm able to, uh, through some level of effort, determine who their neighbors are and uh, those kind of things and basically expand the neighborhood. And I come from the school of thought that says that uh, people only travel so far to get married. Uh, so it creates a limiting effect. Um, also, uh, there are three ways, I think, that land, that, that you will find things. You'll find outright sale of land from the land office. You will find uh, the transfer of military bounty land warrants, Virginia military bounty land warrants. And sometimes you'll find that those bounty land warrants relate to the French and Indian War or some other colonial infarction. But they also were issued in the early 1700s. And off the top of my head, I don't know exactly. 1710, I'm thinking between 1710, 1725 is what I'm thinking. They tried to populate the West in order to create a buffer from the Native Americans. So uh, that failed miserably. They tried to create a string of forts, uh, that kind of thing. Didn't work very well. Uh, so there are those. And then there is the concept of head rights. And that if you paid for the passage of someone to be imported into the colony, transported into the colony, you would get 50 acres of land. And those are useful because they usually will list who was transported. Usually most of the head right ones are found 
uh, in the first few volumes, although there are some in the others. Uh, the way that I use these books is if I have a good idea about when somebody arrived, I'll go to that year in the volumes. For example, volume one covers the period 1623 to 1666. And, for, and then like volume four covers the period of 1732 to 1741. So there are more head rights in the 1600s than there are in the 1700s. Uh, and I think if you don't have a good understanding of head rights and don't have a good understanding of the Virginia Land Office and how it operated and the Northern Neck Proprietary for that matter also, you should take a look at Virginia Land Grants by Fairfax Harrison, which is probably the best book on the subject of uh, both the Fairfax Proprietary and the Virginia Land Office and the patents that were created by them. So let's go to volume one and just open up a page and see what we can find that might be interesting. So Valentine Patton, a uh, thousand acres, Westmoreland County, 6 June, 1654, page 272. Upon the south and north at the head of Oikwi, I guess, river, uh, west southwest along the land of Richard Codsford, etc. So we know at least one neighbor. Transportation of 20 persons, gallery, McAllister, John McAllister, Henry McAllister, excuse me, Hector McAllister, Daniel Gray, John Wright, John Cook, Thomas Levine, William Gage, Robert Pointer, Joan Hoot, Richard Welch, William Ginnings, uh, Michael Upchurch, Francis Shelton, Thomas Green, John Breakworth, James Collett, and Thomas Wood. So here we see the transportation of 20 people and for 20 times 50 is 1,000, so we got 1,000 acres. So that's one way that folks get land. Another way that folks get land, unfortunately, um, sometimes you'll find like, for example, Lieutenant Colonel Sam Matthews, uh, of course that's probably Samuel Matthews based on the stuff, 2,000 acres in the freshes of Rappahannock River about a mile above Nansman Town, beginning at an oak standing by the river, dividing his farm. This from 800 acres, surveyed for Vincent Stafford, 7 September, 1634, page 276. Transportation of 40 persons, and they aren't named. So sometimes they're named. Most times they, I find that they are named. Now, you'll also find, uh, and I didn't, locate a, a land grant for um, military service but I could but we can talk about where they're just purchasing some uh, John Freeman 350 acres on Surrey County north side of Nottoway River on the northwest side of Fellows Branch in the galley southwest by the county line uh, north 60 degrees east between Surrey and Prince George counties Adjacent said Freeman, Richard Hudson, John Jackson, Edward Eccles, 2 August, 1736, page 147, one pound, 15 shillings. So this would be a purchase. But notice we also have neighbors. And I think this is the John Freeman that we actually have, uh, how fortuitous, uh, the John Freeman that we actually have a genealogy for, um, but I'm not positive of that. I'm going to have to look at that and see. So, again, I say that it's not possible to really do colonial research outside of the Northern Neck anyway um, without having access to Cavaliers and Pioneers. Now, there is also a multi-volume set that deals with Northern Neck land grants uh, published by Genealogical Publishing Company. And there is also a set of Northern Neck surveys uh, by Joyner, published by Iberian. And we carry all of those here at Heritage Books. So we basically are able to cover the entire colony of Virginia in the colonial period in regards to its land transactions. 
since they were all done either by the Virginia Land Office or the Fairfax Proprietary or the Northern Neck. So I didn't pull the Northern Neck books, um, the surveys or the abstracts of the transactions, uh, but we'll include them uh, in this little foray that we're doing today in regards to Virginia land. So we will create a discount code of CP20 and that will get you a 20% discount on any volume that you would be interested in purchasing. Um, I don't know how I could do Virginia colonial research without these books. I, one of the things that I like to do is to create the neighborhoods and I don't necessarily plot out the actual deeds because I really don't have sufficient information to do the actual deed but what I might do is like do a um, some sort of geometric based on the number of neighbors that surround and then put the neighbors there in the right place then go look for the neighbors entries in Cavaliers and Pioneers or in the Northern Neck uh, abstracts and then build on that and basically I'm able to create a neighborhood and I'll go out a little bit um, in order to see what that neighborhood looks like because that's the cohort the catchment population that is the fan the the friends the associates the neighbors that are going to be very integral to our research uh, because they knew these people in ways that we don't know these people. And that's an important concept to be able to grab hold of that we want other people to tell us about our ancestors. And the people we want to tell us about our ancestors are their neighbors, their friends, their family, their associates. And we always have to focus on them, especially if we've created our own little brick wall or there is a brick wall, whether we created it or not. So this is Craig, this has been Just Genealogy, and we've been talking about Cavaliers and Pioneers specifically, and sort of talking about Northern Neck land grants. And we'll set up a discount code again of CP20 for Cavaliers and Pioneers, the eight volumes plus the supplement, and then the Northern Neck surveys and the Northern Neck uh, grants. And that will be so much fun. And you can buy the, of course, you don't have to buy the sets. You can buy the individual pieces one by one. And that discount will be around for a while until 25 people have used it. So if you can't afford to buy the set now, you can just sort of try to buy it a little bit at a time. I'm doing the best I can. So this has been Craig. This has been Just Genealogy, where we're converting people doing genealogy into genealogists day by day. Live tired, that's what I say. Y'all have a great day.